All right. Good afternoon, guys. Um, we are very excited that you've joined us today. We are doing our webinar on creating a climate of high expectations. So we're really excited about this webinar. We feel like and this is a great tool and we're going to get a lot of great information today uh, for you guys to use um, when creating your child's goals and um, making sure you set them up for success when we have these high expectations. I am Megan Sanders, Training and Evaluation Specialist for Partners Resource Network, and joining me today is Christina Henning, who is the Director of Statewide Services. Partners Resource Network is the statewide agency that operates the Parent Training and Information Centers. We have the PATH Project, the PIN Project, and the TEAM Project. And we are federally funded through Department of Education and the Office of Special Education Programs. We offer um, information, training, education, emotional support, and anything that we can do for parents of kiddos with disabilities birth to 26 years of age. So today, um, we have a guest speaker. Her name is Ms. Brandy Timmons, and I'm going to introduce her and give you a little bit of info and then we'll let her get started. Brandy Timmons is the Education Director for Social Motion Skills, which is a nonprofit in Houston, Texas, that provides both on-site and virtually a lifespan of social, vocational, and independent living skills training to individuals with social cognitive challenges. She is a licensed behavior analyst and has 15 years in the public school setting as a special education teacher and an autism specialist. She loves to write and she uses that skill daily, writing social skills lessons and parent educator trainings. Her passion is creating a high level of expectation for students and then supporting them as they rise to meet those expectations. So thank you so much for uh, joining us today, Brandy. I'm gonna let you go ahead and get started. Thank you, Megan. Hi everyone, I'm glad to be back with y'all again today. Um, like Megan said, I am the Education Director for Social Motion Skills. And we have just a lifespan of programs for um, those are, that are on the autism spectrum and that have other um, social cognitive challenges. Um, a lot of what I've done in my career is working with those on the autism spectrum. So you'll hear, you may hear me say that a lot today, but all of the strategies that we use and everything that we're gonna talk about um, you know, really applies to any child with special needs, any special education program that you're creating. So if I do um, forget and say that um, when I'm talking, just realize that's where my background is. Um, I am a licensed behavior analyst. I have never um, done clinical work. I have always worked in the school setting. So I was a special educator for um, over 15 years. And I've taught um, all different levels from PPCD all the way through um, 12th grade. And so now here at Social Motion, we were, our youngest right now is seven and our oldest is 54. So we truly, um, truly do have experience with, you know, just, just about every diagnosis, every um, level. There's a lot of things that, um, you know, I've seen, I've done, worked with. Parent training is a huge focus of ours. And so... That's what I want to talk about today. Um, through my experience working in the public school systems, um, one of the things that always bothered me the most was those kiddos that would come to my classroom that were coming from other programs that maybe had, you know, not been in school before. And the kids have never had expectations placed on them. And we, as a teacher, you know, I recognized that and tried to create a climate in my classroom to where everyone had the same expectations. And that's exactly what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I'll never forget IEP meetings that I would go to. And just for, just for an example, I went to an IEP meeting for a, um, a fifth grader coming into my sixth grade self-contained classroom. And I was talking with the teacher and what she said to me was basically, he doesn't talk much. He reads at about a first grade level and he does preschool math. And we're working on him coloring and staying in the lines right now. 
Well, within a year, that same student was reading at a fourth grade level. He was playing baritone in the middle school band and he was running cross country. And two years later, we had transitioned him out of our self-contained classroom into all general education classes. And I spoke with um, a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago, as a matter of fact, and he just graduated from a regular education program. He's working, he's held a job for two years. And I had another student that came to us and she was 14 years old and she was nonverbal. She did have a very low IQ, um, but the teacher's report to us was basically, it's difficult to write any goals for her because she doesn't follow directions and she doesn't do anything academic. But when she came to us, she was still in diapers. She was drinking out of a sippy cup. But within two weeks, we had her potty trained and learned to drink out of a straw. And within a year, she was writing her name without any help. Kids like that made us realize, you know, these kids are coming to us and people are looking at the outside and they're looking at IQ scores and they are looking at testing that doesn't truly give us a good picture of our kids. And because of those things, they're not setting expectations for them. So as a classroom teacher, we made sure, I made sure that those that I worked with had the knowledge and had the skills to set high expectations and to make sure that those things were reached. Um, my special education director noticed, our principal noticed, the other teachers noticed, the students in the school district noticed, and it wasn't very long before my kids weren't those kids anymore. They were the kids that um, everyone, had to, everyone wanted to be involved with them. All of the um, groups and organizations in the school would reach out to me and make sure that my kids were being included, that my kids were being um, asked to participate in everything that everyone else was participating in. Other teachers would send emails and just ask, have your kids been invited to the field trip this week? Have your kids... Um, been invited to sit with a group at the pep rally this week. And the really cool thing about it was that I didn't have to try hard. I didn't have to work at that um, because those were the expectations. I'm sorry, I get busy talking and forget to change the slides. <clears throat> My students weren't tolerated anymore and they weren't even just included. They were embraced as part of the school community. So what we're going to talk about today, and my program, this um, particular presentation that I, that I do, I typically do for um, school districts and for classroom teachers, but today we're going to talk as it more towards parents, how you can communicate these things to those that are creating programs for your child, as well as things that you can do um, in your home to ensure that um, the program that you're creating is setting those high expectations. First of all, you have to expect the students to be successful. You have to have that attitude when they come into your room, knowing that um, they are going to be successful. You just have to believe that and you have to under make sure that everyone else that's involved with the students believe that as well. You have to intentionally set the standards high. You have to push them to achieve more than they've ever achieved before. And you have to expect them to follow rules just like everyone else. You can't um, let them get away with things that other students are getting away with, uh, would not get away with. And then you have to communicate those expectations. Make sure that everyone that's involved with your child knows what the expectations are. If you're working with um, a team of therapists, Make sure that you communicate to all of the therapists. One of the um, biggest hurdles that we had in our classroom was when you would set an expectation for a child and then maybe they would leave your room and go to PE or they would go to a specials class and that teacher didn't follow the same rules. So everything that you would work so hard to accomplish in the classroom, when you get out 
into another environment, it all, you have to start back over, basically. One of the things that we talk about at Social Motion is we're not, we're not bringing a program to anyone. We're making sure that you have the knowledge and that you have the skills to be able to implement the things that you need to implement into your everyday life. Because um, teaching social skills, which is what we do the most, shouldn't be a one hour program. It's an all day, every day part of your life. For your kids, that level of high expectations, same thing. It needs to be all day, every day, just a natural part of their lives. So just a little bit of background and where I'm coming from as far as setting this high expectation. Um, like I said a minute ago, I have worked with those with autism for a very long time. But bigger than that, there's approximately one in six children right now that are diagnosed with a developmental delay or a neurodevelopmental disorder. That's a lot of kids. That's a lot of kids coming through classrooms and in school districts. When those kiddos come into your room and you assume that they're not capable of doing things, you're taking away their right to try. You're taking away that natural right that other kids are given. We make our kids prove to us that they can do things before they're ever given the chance to even try. Um, one of the things that happens with a lot of our kids is the education takes place from the bottom up instead of the top down. But when you're working with kids that have a neurodevelopmental disability, what happens is a lot of times they're going to learn the skill, but they're not going to learn them in the same order or at the same time that their typical peers are going to learn. So what that looks like is you have a student that's in kindergarten that you're trying to teach them how to write. Well, they're not ready to do that. And the teacher ends up spending a lot of time on handwriting when they could be moving on and doing more advanced skills. So when we're teaching our kiddos, we have to start from the top. You set the same expectations that you have for everyone else, and then you support. You back up, you find the gaps, and you support where you need to. When you assume that a student isn't capable, we change the way we talk to them. We talk down to our kids. And for so many of them, especially those that are nonverbal, that may have, you know, no cognitive disability at all, that can be very degrading to them. That can be very demeaning to them. So our kids need to hear the basic vocabulary, the same things that you're talking to all of their typical peers about. And then we also leave them out of social opportunities. They don't get to try the things that other kids get to try. They don't get to be involved in all the groups and activities that other kids are involved in. I like this, um, what Kathy Snow had to say. It's easy to see our actions put people with disabilities in a no-win situation. Because we presume in competence, we don't give them opportunities to demonstrate their competence. And it just creates a vicious circle. But what happens when we do assume competency? Our students want to please. If we assume that a student is capable, we're gonna look for the evidence to prove that. If we assume that they can do things, we're gonna look for things to prove to us that they, that they are capable and that they are doing that. The Pygmalion effect. There was a study done um, and basically, a group of kids were given, um, they were given an, an um, achievement test and the results were shared with the teachers. And the teachers were told that those that scored at the top 20, you know, there was a group that had scored at the top 20% of that, um, that test. And so that whole year, those teachers went through the year thinking that this one group of kids was much more high achieving than the rest of the kids. Well, come to find out that wasn't the truth. Um, no one had scored any differently and there wasn't a 20%, but they got to the end of the school year and that's that group of kids that those teachers had set high expectations for ended up scoring higher than all of the other kids in the classroom. 
our kids meet the expectations that we set for them. They're willing to take risk when they know that we believe in them and they know that we have set those expectations and they feel safe. They feel safe because they know that we have that belief in them. When you start talking about creating a program that's setting a high level of expectation, you have to ask a few questions. And when I present to schools and when I present to classes, these are the things that I ask. First of all, do all the staff members believe that all students can learn? If you're working with therapists, if you have a team that's working with your child, it's important for you to make sure that everyone on your child's team believes that they are capable and believes that they um, can achieve. Do the staff members believe they can make a difference in the lives of all students? I worked in an extremely large school district um, for a year as a BCBA, and it was very eye-opening to me to see the teachers that were in those classrooms that didn't really have a desire to teach, and I'm not sure that they felt like that they could make a difference and that they could make changes in the students' lives. Um, it was sad that they were in the classroom because they really didn't belong there. So as a parent, make sure that those educators that are working with your kids believe that they can make a difference in the lives of your child, of your children. Do staff members understand how students can learn? This piece is vitally important. A lot of the teachers that are in our classrooms right now don't have the training. They don't know what to do to help our kids in the best way. Advocate for the teachers that are in your kids' classrooms. If you know that there's training out there that would benefit them, share that with the principal. Let them know that you support them in getting that training. If you have a child that's on the autism spectrum, that is part of the autism supplement when you do your IEPs, um, is making sure that you have someone that's trained to work with your child and make sure that those teachers are receiving that um, training. And does the organization possess a no excuses attitude toward learning for all students? Same thing, if you've got your kids involved in any kind of inter um, therapies, um, any kind of outside interventions, with your school, make sure that the organization has a no excuse attitude. They need to believe and they need to set expectations for your kid. All right, this piece, um, one of the first steps that we're gonna talk about is knowing your student. So knowing your child. As a parent, this piece is a little bit easier for you than it is for schools. But what you can do is you can help the teacher. When I present this um, training to teachers, I explain to them that they need to make sure that they know their children um, in their classrooms. Not just knowing them academically, but they need to know them personally. They need to know what their likes and their dislikes are. They need to know the kinds of things that are gonna really want, um, that are gonna really get that child's interest. There's so many ways that a teacher can use a child's likes and dislikes and build them into their classroom um, instruction. So you as a parent can help them with that. When your child goes to a new classroom, take with them a portfolio. Create something that goes beyond just the typical everyday um, information that a teacher is going to receive. Let, the, let that teacher know, if your child loves the color blue, let her know that they love the color blue. If there is a particular song or book that your child just thinks is amazing, let that teacher know that, so that she can build that into your child's day and use that. I share this chart with um, teachers and I, I ask them to use this chart and I ask them to find out particular interests that their students have and to put a date beside when they talk to the child about that interest. I ask them to be intentional about getting to know those kids. So again, as the parent, let that teacher know, 
if there are things that have been tried behaviorally for your child that work, save the teacher the time. Don't let her have to figure those things out. Share with her and let her know what it is that's been tried and what works and what doesn't work. Um, a lot of times teachers spend you know, the first few weeks just trying to figure those things out and it would be so helpful to them if a student walked in, you know, on that um, get to know the teacher night, the back to school nights, if you walked in with all that information available and shared that with that teacher, they want to know and it's going to help them in creating the, um, the programming for the class. If your child uses visuals at home, if you already have a system set up that um, those visuals are helpful, then share those with the teacher as well. Make copies of them, send them to the teacher and let her see them. Even if you're not sure how they're going to fit into um, the day-to-day -day school activities, it's okay. Just go ahead and share them with the teacher and let her decide if she can use them in the classroom or if they can be modified in some way to be used. Setting short-term goals. This is important and it goes back to knowing your kids as well. You can use this at home. Um, when your child is working on learning new tasks, it's important for you to know what level they're at to start with because you're not going, you don't want to give them things that are going to frustrate them. One of the, um, an important piece of behavioral analysis is what we call behavioral momentum. Everyone likes to be successful. Everyone likes to feel successful. Our kids do as well. And so many times they don't get that opportunity so it's important for us to break our goals down into smaller pieces. When you break them down into smaller pieces, then you make it more likely for them to be successful. And once they feel successful at something that might not be very difficult, that um, might be a little bit easier, then you can use that momentum from that success to give them something a little bit harder to try, okay? Um, this can be as simple as, if you know that they know how to write all of the letters of the alphabet, but they haven't learned how to put a word together yet, well, have them write the letter C, have them write the letter A, have them write the letter T individually, let them be successful, praise them for that, and as soon as they've done that, have them write the word together, okay? It works for anything that you're teaching, um, as long as they, have that success, you praise them for it, and as soon as they feel successful, then you build on that and give them something um, a little bit more difficult to do. Now, part of being able to do that is what's called task analysis. You've probably heard of task analysis before. Um, basically, it's breaking down a task into all of its component pieces. Task analysis is extremely useful when you're teaching new skills. Um, task analysis can be a little more complicated than what um, you typically think. I, when I do these presentations um, live, I usually have the group task analyze brushing their teeth. And so we talk about that and I usually have them work through the task analysis and then I'll ask how many steps did you come up with? Typically, most groups come up with about 15 to, you know, 15, 16. Occasionally, they'll come up with 20 or a few more than that. Well, when I was doing my, um, my coursework for, <coughs> excuse me, for my BCBA, one of our grades was task analyzing brushing your teeth. And the number of steps that were um, on the test were, was actually over 100. <coughs> Excuse me. So don't be afraid to break a task down into very small pieces. If a child is having difficulty with tying shoes, I know that's a really hard skill for a lot of our kids to learn. Break it down in really, really small pieces. And, you know, just like everything else nowadays, if you're not sure how to task analyze something, if you Google task analysis of a skill, typically the steps will pop up. 
and someone else has probably already done that for you. The Goldilocks principle. Um, the Goldilocks principle is basically exactly what it sounds like. You want to make sure that you're not giving a child something that's too easy. You don't want to give them something that's too hard. You want to make sure that the skills that you're giving them are just right. Okay? And this goes back to knowing your child, understanding how your child learns, knowing the skills that they already know. Um, when a child becomes frustrated, we see behaviors increase. So if you start out with something that's too easy, a lot of people don't think about this. A lot of our kids get bored when things are too easy. And we also see behaviors increase. Same thing with too hard. If their material is too hard for them to do, your behaviors are gonna increase, okay? Um, if you're familiar with teaching at all, you want to teach them at their instructional level. It's the material is just right because they can be successful if you provide some support. And we'll talk about that um, in just a second. Um, they need to be trying hard enough that it doesn't get boring, but they don't need to have to try so hard that they're going to get frustrated with it. So know your child, know what their attention span is know um, where their frustration level is, and set the task accordingly. Now, one way to um, make sure that you're doing these you know, tasks at the right level is just to do a simple assessment. Um, don't make it so that it's um, like a test. Just get them to try a skill. You know, Don't worry about it if they get it right or wrong, and just see how much of the skill they can do and then you'll know um, where you need to set the task level. So the important part about um, instructional level is the support. Prompting and cueing is important for a child to learn. Um, when you prompt your child, you're going to provide exactly enough support for them to be able to complete the task successfully. Now, there's a lot of different types of prompts and there's a lot of different types of cues. If you Google the hierarchy of prompting and cueing, then um, you'll see diagrams that explain what those types of prompts and cues are. Typically, a hierarchy of prompting and cueing is set up to look like a pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid is what we call our natural cues. And your natural cues are those things that drive all of us to complete a task. Um, you know, if someone um, waves and smiles at me, that's a natural cue for me to speak to them again the next time I see them. Um, at school, a natural cue for most children is getting a good grade on a paper. But for many of our kiddos, those cues aren't enough. They haven't learned to associate those and they're not reinforcing enough for them to want to do the task correctly. So we have to do other types of prompts and we have to do other types of cues. Um, what's important to remember about prompting and cueing, however, is that we have to be careful to fade the prompts and cues. After a child has learned to do something with a prompt, the next time that you give them the task, you need to give them the task with a, a less intrusive type of prompt and continue fading that until they don't need any prompting at all and they can complete the task independently. If you don't fade prompts and cues, what's gonna happen is you're gonna create what we call learned helplessness. I know a lot of you have probably heard that term. As a school teacher, it was one of the hardest battles to fight was when you had a child that came to you that had learned helplessness. 
basically that's the student that can do anything all day long as long as someone's standing beside them holding their hand. That's the child that can, um, you know, do tasks as long as there's one person in the room with them. Um, but as soon as you ask them to do that task independently, they don't understand what to do and they can't do it anymore. It's very difficult to, um, to unteach that. Um, here at Social Motion, we work with a lot of adults. And unfortunately, we have a lot of adults that come to us from the school systems that have learned helplessness. Um, many of our kiddos in their programs are placed with um, paraprofessionals. They have inclusion aids. And unfortunately, a lot, of those, um, a lot of those instructors don't know how to use prompting and cueing correctly. And they do too many things for our kids. And by the time that our kiddos have graduated, um, you know, they've graduated without a lot, a lot of independent skills. They may have skills, but they don't have them independently. So it's very, very important for you as a parent when you're working with your child at home to keep that into consideration. I know as a parent, it's easier sometimes just to want to do it for them. I know that. I understand that. Um, but in the best interest of your child, you've got to remember that to build that independence, you want to create that climate of high expectations for them. You've got to assume competency and assume that they're capable of, capable of doing that on their own. So what does that look like? Um, take the child that, um, for instance, is learning to ride a bike. Okay, fading a prompt, we're all familiar with that. When a child learns to ride a bike the first time, you're giving them physical prompting. You are helping them keep that bike upright without them falling. And so you're using your hands, putting your hands on the bike and helping them. Well, the next time they go out there to ride, you're not gonna hold on for so long. You're gonna hold on to the bike for a little while and then you're gonna let go and let them try it on their own. And you're gonna continue fading that. Well, that's, you didn't realize you were doing that, but that is what prompting, um, prompt fading looks like. It can be done in many, many ways. If you're physically prompting to start with, and then you back off and you give a verbal prompt, and then the next time you may only give a gestural prompt like pointing, okay, those are ways to fade as well. Um, what that looks like when you're writing, when you're teaching a writing skill. The first time you have them practice, they may be tracing a solid line. After they've been successful at that, you may fade that solid line back until there's only a um, dotted line. And when they're successful with that, you may fade back into there's only starting points for the letters. That's all considered prompt fading. So just learn to use that. Learn to um, keep in the forefront of your mind that it's, it's always okay for you to prompt and to cue for a child to be successful when they need it. But it's also important for you to remember to fade those cues away so that they don't have to have your help to do, to do those skills. Building on a learner's strengths. Set goals that allow the student to use natural abilities and incorporate those strengths into other tasks as much as possible, okay? All students have strengths. You as a parent, you're gonna know your students, your child's strengths. You're going to know what they are. And you know, a lot of times we, um, in schools, some of our child's strengths are looked at as weaknesses and um, we forget to look at them the right way. And I'm so sorry, I keep forgetting that I have a presentation. I just keep talking. Um, there's our prompting and cueing. Here we are. Adaptability, compassion, commitment, courage, determination, daring, endurance, faith, friendship, energy, flexibility, perseverance, respect, 
All of these are amazing strengths that um, a lot of our learners have. Now, what does that look like in um, an educational setting? Well, that child that doesn't want to put their paper away until they have completely finished all the work on the paper, a lot of times they get in trouble for that. They get in trouble for not um, putting their pencil away when the teacher expects them to. But you know what? If we turn around and we look at that as endurance, that's a great strength for our kids, and we have to learn to look for those things. Um, and this is where you as a parent can help. If you know that your child has these strengths, share those things with the teachers. Share those things and help them to know and to expect and to look for those things um, in your child. A lot of our kids are very resilient. A lot of our kids have to, have to go through things that other people um, will never experience and they're very resilient about that. Share those things um, with the teacher and help them to know. Share those things with therapists and let them know. These are things that, um, that my kid has that are very strong um, and help them to use those. Because those are the kinds of things that we need to look for um, when we're praising the kids. All right, making expectations explicit. Define instructions clearly and concisely. Don't dumb them down. That's not what I'm talking about. But we do need to cut out unnecessary words. We talk a lot. When we're talking to our kids, we say a lot of things that are not necessary. And we make it difficult for our kids to follow instructions because we don't make the instructions clear. So for example, if a teacher were to say, okay, everyone, please put your papers away and then come to the rug for story time. Be sure to push your chairs under the table. That's a lot of words for a child to have to dig through to actually find what the instructions are. When we could have said more simply, okay, papers away, chairs under your table, to the rug. Three short, simple instructions. The kids hear it and they don't have to think about it. They don't have to dig through all of those other words to figure out what it is that they're supposed to be doing. Now, once you've learned to do that, it's not a natural thing to do. As teachers, um, when I do trainings, we have to practice. Um, I do a lot of coaching over that. How do you get rid of those extra words? Um, how do you use just the necessary words? If you still have a child that is having trouble following instructions, even after you've cut out the unnecessary words, break the instructions down into smaller steps. Give them one or two instructions rather than giving all the instructions at one time. And for everyday rules and expectations, use visuals to support understanding. Visuals are always okay. A lot of our kids are visual learners. If they can see it, they're gonna understand it and they're gonna remember it. So post pictures so that the students have clear models of what they're supposed to do. If a child can't read yet, make sure that the pictures are clear enough that they understand exactly what it is that they are supposed to be doing. And, um, you know, for some students, it's okay for the instructions just to be on a wall somewhere. But for others, you may need to post those instructions on the table, on the desk. Same thing at home. Use visuals throughout your home. You know, if you have a child that you're working on independence, this is a great way to fade those verbal prompts that you've been giving them and to help them to build that independence. Use the pictures, make schedules for different things. If you have a child that you know, if you're standing beside them, they can follow all the steps and brush their teeth successfully. Well, put those directions on a paper using pictures and tape it to the counter in the bathroom. Tape it to the mirror so that they can see those steps and follow without you having to use the words. Okay, visual um, schedules. Every home should have a calendar. 
every home should be have a calendar that's functional for your child. If you have a calendar where everything's written out and they don't read yet, that calendar's not doing your child any good. So use pictures, create a calendar that has the pictures um, so that your child knows what their day looks like, what their month looks like, Use those visuals to help them to um, know what to expect and to be able to, and to be able to follow the expectations that you have for them. Praising at a seven to one ratio and using behavior specific praise. This is not natural. Um, for teachers in a classroom. I know it's probably not natural for parents at home. Um, we like to think that we praise um, our kids. We probably have good intentions about praising our kids. But when we're praising, we have to be very careful to make sure that we're praising the specific behavior. Our kids need to hear from us what is expected and the more that they hear it from us the more apt they are to continue to show us um, the correct behaviors so it's more than just saying good job it's more than saying thank you for example good job putting your papers away well that child just heard what it was that they did that you were proud of them for I like the way you're sitting quietly. Great job writing your name on your paper. You shared with your friend. Good job. All of those are behavior specific. Um, as a parent at home, it might sound a little bit awkward to do that, and that's okay. Um, if you have a child that's having a behavior issue that you're trying to correct, it's especially important to do this um, and praise when they're exhibiting the correct behavior. Now, along the same lines is using positive language. Reframe your corrections in a positive way because there's gonna there are gonna be times when you have to correct them. But instead of saying don't run, you're gonna say walk in the hallway, please. Um, again, using positive um, language doesn't always come naturally. One of the things that I talk to my teachers about, I don't like to hear the word no and don't from a teacher. A child, um, you know, our kids typically, they hear that so often, but that's part of the language that needs to be changed in the classroom. It's part of the language that needs to be changed at home especially when we are working on um, changing behaviors. We need to be giving them the positive reframing of, um, of a correction. Be intentional. The more you practice, the more natural it will become. All right. Whoop. Sorry, again, forgot to change the... Um, slide. Don't give the correct answers. This one is huge. Um, here at Social Motion, one of the things that we really emphasize is training parents to be their child's social coach. Um, social skills, for example, most programs are an hour a week um, that leaves 167 hours the rest of the week for parents to be coaching their child to use skills correctly. And this is, this is a, coaching, um, a coaching technique. Instead of giving correct answers to your child, you're going to ask probing and leading questions. You want your child to be able to figure out answers on their own. Problem solving is huge for our kids, and it's a skill that they all need to know. As adults, problem solving skills are crucial. We use them every day, and our kids don't have enough opportunity to learn to problem solve on their own. 
They have people that solve problems for them all the time. So if your child is trying to figure out an answer to something or trying to figure out a solution, don't just give the solution to them. Ask those questions, ask those probing questions, ask those leading questions. Help them to come to, um, help them to come to the solution on their own. A lot of our kiddos um, don't pick up skills intuitively from other people. And when I'm working with parents, what I explain to them is um, our brains are like a filing cabinet. We have all kinds of situations that we experience that we file away. So every time we experience a new situation, we have something to refer to. We can go back into our filing cabinet and our brain automatically pulls that situation out and says, oh, I've done this before. I've experienced this before. And if this is how I handled it before and it worked, then maybe I should try that again. Well, our kids need our need their filing cabinets filled we have to be intentional about helping them to create those situations that's why we teach things directly that's why we're very intentional about teaching them skills so when a child has to figure out a problem on their own and has to reach a solution on their own then we're helping develop we're helping them develop that filing cabinet we're giving them that reference so that the next time they come to a situation that they don't understand, they can look back and their brain goes, oh man, I had to figure out that problem once before. I wonder if this would work in this situation. So the more that we can help them to, um, to probe and ask themselves those questions, the more that we can help them to, um, to learn those problem solving skills. And along that line, don't just tell a learner what they've done wrong. Same thing. Um, oops, sorry. We don't just tell them what they've done wrong. We ask leading questions that's going to help the learner. Um, that's going to help the learner to figure out what it is that they need to do um, differently for that. Um, in that situation and once they figured out what they've done wrong then we need to help them figure out what they should do instead so when a learner understands the rationale for a skill and recognizes the personal value of knowing a skill they're much more likely to use the skill later giving longer response time as you've seen the um the clock going Wait at least five seconds before you repeat a question. If you, um, if you have given a child an instruction or if you've asked the child a question, a lot of our kids, especially those with neurodevelopmental disorders, have um, processing issues. And it takes them longer to process and it takes them longer to um, decide what it is they need to say or what it is that they need to do. So give them longer time to figure those things out. For some, it may need to be longer than five seconds. Um, as you know, you know, get to figure out your child, then you're gonna understand how long it takes them. And most of our kids, you can look at them and you can pretty much tell if they're thinking about it and trying to figure out a solution. But one thing to remember is that if you repeat a question, repeat it verbatim, repeat it word for word so that they don't have to start over processing what it is that they've been asked. Behavior is communication. Always remember that every behavior that your child is exhibiting has a function. It's important for you to know and understand the basics of behavior. Um, regardless if you're a teacher or a parent, it's crucial to know 
and understand those, um, those basics. You can find, um, there's lots and lots of trainings out there for free. You can Google and find trainings on basic behavior strategies. Um, the more that you understand behavior, the easier it is going to be to help change a child's behavior. And it's important to know how to teach replacement behaviors. So if you have a child that's having um, a behavior difficulty, we need to understand why, what that function is. If they are um, exhibiting a behavior because they're trying to escape from something, we need to understand what is it that they're trying to escape from. Is the work too hard? Are they trying to get out of that work um, because it's frustrating them? Well, if it is, there's very specific strategies that we can use to help overcome those um, and change that behavior. But we need to understand um, those strategies and know what to do, um, know what to do for our kids. So again, be informed, um, seek out help with those kinds of things. If you can find a short training, a lot of them are not very long. Um, just taking a basic um, behavior 101 class uh, will help you immensely in um, behaviors at home. Make sure that those, uh, the teachers that are working with your child, make sure that they understand behavior. Ask that question. It's perfectly okay to ask um, the school district if the teacher that's working with your child has had any behavior um, classes if they know how to um, deal with um, behaviors and if they know how to teach replacement behaviors. Um, a lot of teachers think that they understand behavior, um, but they may not know the specifics about figuring out the functions and replacing behaviors. So ask those questions. Ask um, and find out about those that are working with your child, whether or not they understand those things. Um, being Per intentional with personal interactions. For you as a parent, this is not um, not not as applicable applicable. But for teachers, um, I talk to them about this a lot. Teachers should never be afraid of our kids. Sorry, I'm going to just stop sharing. Too much trouble with that. Um, some of our kids' disabilities look different. Some of their behaviors are gonna be different. Um, teachers are going to um, encounter, you know, honestly, there's gonna be behaviors that are just scary. Um, some of our kids are gonna have habits that might not be, um, that may just be growth. Um, but we need to make sure that whoever it is that's working with our kids understands that there's nothing to be afraid of, they need to um, they need to be intentional with their interactions, um, and by that I mean standing close to the kids, um, giving them high fives, smiling at them, all of those interactions that they have with um, with the other students in the classroom. Okay, so. Hi, ladies. I figured we were getting close to close to time for Q and A, so we will stop there. And um, if we have questions, I don't know how. Do y'all have them written down, or how how is that going to work? We have them. All right. Well, so if you have questions, you can go ahead and type them in this Q and A box. It's on the bottom left hand side. Um, and we will begin answering questions from there. So, okay. all right. First question, my son is high functioning autism and in general education. During his Excel time, he is in a special education class and his teacher is stating he's a role model. He's had school refusals, sick stomach in order to avoid Excel class. He is also beginning to speak out in class, telling them he does not belong there and that he does not like them. He does have a couple of things he needs to learn, like not to blurt out or occasionally saying things inappropriate in order to get attention. How do I get him out of the class so that he can learn to use these skills that he's learned in the class? 
and not be the highest functioning kiddo in the class, it's not fair to him. That's a tough question. Um, bottom line is that's going to be um, an art committee decision. Um, you know, the best case for a parent is having the documentation. You know, if your child is coming home and telling you these things, make sure you have this documented. Um, and I would take those with you to the to the IEP meeting and basically just express your express your concerns. Um, go to the teacher and get documentation from her as well. You know, what what is he doing in the classroom? What you know, if he is the highest functioning in the classroom and he's excelling above everyone else, you know, what is it that you can do to challenge? Um, or, you know, can he start spending more time out in another setting? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So what can you do if a teacher does not believe that the child can achieve higher goals? If the teacher does not believe, then I would start again. Um, if you really have concerns about that, I would go to, first of all to your special education director. Okay, um, you know the changing the climate of high expectations has to be an organizational change. So going to the SPED director is going to be a good start. If you don't get anywhere there go to the principal and talk to the principal about your concerns. You know, um, see what kind of trainings that that teacher might need. A lot of the teachers that are in our school districts, districts right now don't have all the training that they should have. And it's okay for you as a parent to suggest those kinds of things. Okay. Independent skills and living are a huge concern in my child's education program. Do you have any suggestions about speaking with teachers regarding the fading prompts and clues? Um, again, yes. Um, I would ask the teachers if they're familiar with the um, hierarchy of prompting and cueing. Um, if they are, I would ask for documentation of how they use that, how they implement that. Um, that independence building is something that sh a lot of people don't talk about in their IEP meetings that should be talked about. So when you have that meeting, I would stress to everyone that that, that is a concern and that you don't want that learned helplessness um, to begin with your child and ask them how they're building in the fading into, into the goals and into the classroom setting. Okay. And then can you um, just repeat what EATS stands for? Yes. Escape, attention, tangible, sensory. Thank you. All right. How do you determine if a school staff is fading support as they should? Again, ask for documentation. Start, you know, ask them what, um, what prompts and cues they started with. Ask them specifically what prompts and cues they're going to move to and what their plan is for moving from um, a level of prompting and cueing to independence. What are some strategies for work avoidance in a child with ODD? Um, that is more of a behavioral um, question, probably for another another um, presentation because that that's a big one. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do if it is truly avoidance um, and a, which is escape. Then one of the biggest things is what we talked about in the presentation was um, that um, the Goldilocks principle figuring out if what you're expecting is too hard or too easy. So that's always a good place to start. Um, but there's a lot of other strategies as well, so. Okay. Yeah, we actually had two questions about that. Right. Here we go. All right. What if the special education department does not support meaningful inclusion behind the scenes? My district actively directs our committee members covertly to push for more segregated settings. 
Hmm. That's interesting. Um, is that only at the campus level? Um, if it's only at the campus level, then I would move towards, you know, um, depending on how large the school district is, it just kind of climb up the chain of command. Um, you know, if you go to the SPED director and let her know, he'll know what's going on and find out why that's happening. Um, and then if you don't get anywhere there, of course, you know, just keep climbing up. That's a, that's a big one, difficult to um, address. A lot of it comes from, you know, just training from uh, top staff down. Okay, and there was a follow-up that says it comes from the special education director. Yeah, then I would definitely go, you know, go to the superintendent um, and start there and find out, you know, why that's happening and what kind of training needs to be um, involved. Okay, and um, we'll see if any more questions come into the Q&A. There was a question in the chat box posed um, earlier in the presentation. And it was, what do you mean when teaching starts from the top? Like, can you give an example of that? Yeah. Um, bottom up teaching is what um, we consider teaching developmentally. So that's like, um, you know, all most kindergartners are expected to um, learn to write, draw their lines and then write their alphabet, so and so on. But when you start from the top down, because most a lot of our kids don't pick up skills in the same developmental order that others do, you're teaching at the same expectation as peers. And so you instead of teaching developmentally up, you start where the peers' expectations are and you support. You just find the smaller gaps and you support those gaps, which is where the prompting and the cueing comes in. Sure. Okay, we do have a couple more questions that came in, but um, for time's sake, if we can go ahead and wrap up the recording, then um, if you have a few extra minutes, I would love to keep you yeah. on. To answer those okay. That come in. Okay, so again, um, thank you for joining us today. We hope that you got the information that you were looking for. We do have a few more webinars coming up um, quickly. So um, we have our statewide and collaborative webinar with TEA. That one's Tuesday, February 26th at 12.15. Um, so just standard time. We're doing students' rights when disciplined for a behavioral incident. So if you have questions about um, behavior issues and how your school is handling discipline, um, reach out and uh, join us on February 26th. Also, we do need your questions for these TEA collaboration webinars. So you see that we have a SurveyMonkey link set up for you to submit your questions and they take questions ahead of time. So they cover any questions that have come in at the following TEA webinar. So if you'll please just get those over to us, we're always happy to send them and um, see if they will answer those. The next topic we're taking questions for would be that progress monitoring in March. Coming up Tuesday, March 5th at 12.15, we have Speak Up Empowerment Through Effective Communication, and that one is actually with me. So uh, be sure and join me on March 5th, where we talk about effective communication. You can find out more information about that and get the link to register on our website, which is in the chat box. All right, here is our information for anybody who would like to contact myself or Ms. Christina Henning. And you have our email addresses there. You also have our um, statewide webinar link and our Facebook page. So for everyone who needs to get off, thank you for joining us. Um, anybody that can stick around, we're going to answer a couple more questions with Ms. Brandy Timmons.